Thanksgiving. Some people are under the weather, and some people just don't like the cold. So let's stand, and, you know, in the upper room, think about what happened, and there was a lot less people in the upper room. So I believe that uh, God is definitely here, and uh, let's just take this time. We know that this week is going to be crazy, and we know some of you, I think I say this every year, there's going to be family members that you're going to love to see. And there's, there's going to be those family members that you're like, Lord, help me. Just speaking truth. So this week, instead of going in with a negative, because I've done it before, oh, they're going to just make me crazy. You know how you just think those things. And they're going to say something stupid, and they're going to want to talk politics, or they're going to want to talk religion, you know, if it differs from your opinion. Say, you know what? There's going to be peace, and there's going to be joy. And we're going to love each other. The world has enough going on out there. Sit down to our Thanksgiving dinner with our family. We should find peace and comfort. No matter what spectrum you're on with things, let's do our part to show Christ's love. And love them in spite of beliefs. Love them because that is what the Word tells us to do. Amen? Let's worship Him. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Father God, we love you. We are so thankful that we can come together to worship to worship you, to prepare our hearts to hear the word. Let your presence fill this place in the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.
you for everything that you've done for us.
Father God, we are we are truly grateful today. In the midst of storms, whether past or present, Father God, you have been there for us. When we didn't know how it was going to come out, God, you were faithful. And today, Father, we just choose to reflect upon our blessings, so many of which shine forth the brightest when life feels the darkest. God, thank you for being that unchanging constant that you are there with us and for us. God, not only that, but you are preparing the future to bring about your greatest good for our lives. God, we see through a glass dimly. If we could begin to see all that you are doing for us and in us, God, we would be exponentially more thankful today because you've got us. We thank you for that. And I just want to pray this morning, God, over every person out there on Facebook or here in the house where you've just got a perplexing situation. You don't know how it's going to work out. Father God, right now, I just invite you in to the challenging places, the difficult places, the hurtful places, the places that are covered with question marks. And God, we invite you in. God, to bring peace to every soul, to grant grace to give hope, to remind us, God, how much you love us. God, you loved us so much that you spared not your own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall you not then also freely give us all things? God, thank you for that confidence as we come boldly before your throne of grace today. God, not just to pray for our own needs, but to pray for the needs of our nation. God, our hearts are heavy over so much that goes on across our land in any given week. God, we invite you in. It's our job to be prayer warriors, to stand as watchmen on the wall, to, to give sound and notice when there is a danger. And God, you see it. You see what's going on across our nation and around the world. So, God, we intercede today, praying for the needs of our nation and of our world. God, we need you. No matter what the many may say, God, we know we need you. And we ask you to come to bring healing, to bring grace, to bring revelation, to bring conviction. God, come and heal our land, Father, we pray. And forgive us our sins. God, hear from heaven. Heal our land. We pray this today gratitude, God. Father, now as we continue our worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings, uh, Father, thank you for the privilege of doing this. God, we know that you are our supplier, no matter what uh, the forecasters may say about recession or challenges in 2023. God, we have every confidence that the bank of heaven is very solvent, and God, that you've got us, and we trust you. So, God, we bring today uh, maybe even faith promises coming in today, God, for missions for 23. God, thank you for all that is brought forward. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to receive our tithes and our offerings, so if you want to just start from front to back and bring them on up, thank you for your gifts.
to have all of them up there today. We've missed those of you that have been absent and are so glad to have you all here. And uh, our team, uh, I don't believe all of them, but several of them will be uh, ministering tonight in the community service. So we will have uh, the privilege of hearing from them uh, here again a little bit later today. So just a couple of things to uh, mention to you here on this Sunday before Thanksgiving. Um, faith promises, I, I know there were some more faith promises that came in, but you know every year we do our missions emphasis and we receive our faith promises or our missions pledges for the coming year. And uh, as of last Sunday, we had received 18 faith promises for a total of $1,993. So we, that was a great first step, and I really believe we're going to surpass our last year's goal, which was 2160. I think we're, we're well on our way. So I just want to say thank you to everybody that has put in a faith promise card. And, and if you didn't get one and you'd like to be a part of the missions program here at Eagle Mountain, uh, Brian Brown's got cards back there. If you lift a hand, he'll see that you get a card. And uh, again, thank you for your faithfulness in giving to that. So yes, the community service is tonight at 6 p.m. Um, you know, when the, when the old devil kicks up stuff, how many of you know you ought to expect God to do something good? I think tonight's going to be good. I want to encourage you Come and join us and be a part of this service tonight. It's at 6 o'clock. It's at the Nazarene Church. I um, feel like the old enemy has been working to kind of drown this service out, but he's not going to. And we're going to step up and enjoy the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to worship Jesus, and we're going to have a good time together and uh, give the old devil a black eye. Amen. I love to give the devil a black eye. Amen. The devil's bad. How many of you know that? <laughs> but greater is he that is in us, the Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. So, yeah, the devil's trying to get people scared and sick and isolated and lonely, but we're not buying it, are we? God is for us, and if he's for us, what? Who can be against us? Amen. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Uh, December is rapidly approaching. Uh, we've got some things going on in December. I uh, want to make you aware of if you're not already. We are going to do the live nativity this year. That's another thing that's been kind of uh, a little bit embattled. But we're going to do that on Sunday night, December 4th. We're going to cut it a little shorter. It's going to be from 5 to 6.30. And Eagle Mountain is going to be in the park. And Eagle Mountain is responsible for our shepherds and angels scene. And we did a great job with that two years ago. I, I was really proud of all of our shepherds and angels. And would love to have you sign up. There's a sign-up sheet on the other side of the curtain there. Would love to have you be a part of that, to be a shepherd or an angel. And uh, there, are, there are female shepherdesses, right? So don't feel like you, you got to be a guy to be a shepherd. You don't. Uh, we're just going to have a good time with that. And it's a great thing for kids to do, too. Kids make great angels and shepherds, so uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a fun time. So that is coming up on Sunday night, December 4th. On uh, December 10th, we're going to go to Yoder's. I always love to go to Yoder's. Can I get a witness? Good things happen at Yoder's. It's not as good as church, but it's, it's like up there. And so uh, we're going to do that on the morning of the 10th. The men's breakfast is going to take place at Yoder's at 8.30, and the ladies are going to gather at Yoder's at 8.30. But we're not going to be together. We're going to be in different places so the ladies can talk the way ladies like to talk, and the brothers can talk the way the brothers like to talk. And everybody said, amen. amen. So I, uh, I just took a shot. I made a reservation for 15 in each group, okay? But it would really help if you could sign up to just kind of let me know so I can alter that reservation if I need to. Uh, our Christmas program is coming up on uh, the 18th, uh, the third Sunday in December. We're also going to do our Italian feast that Sunday. 
uh, after our morning service. So the Christmas program will be at night. So Tara is collecting uh, people that would like to be a part of that in, in any way, skit or music. Tara, you want to add anything to that? And this is not going to be on Facebook. We're not. This is this is just the Eagle Mountain Family Christmas. So, just want you to come and just enjoy that. And uh, if you'd like to participate, talk to Tara, and she can give you more information on that. Um, Susie, our our hearts go out to you. Susie's uh, last remaining sister uh, passed away just recently, and our hearts go out to you, Susie, and pray for God's grace. Susie's getting around a little slower, but she's going to get a new knee here in December. I told her she's going to be the bionic woman. She's got two new hips. She's going to have a new knee. I mean, it's just, she, she and Tony, I tell you what, they're just like neck and neck here for, for new parts. But uh, hey, it's working. So, all right. Uh, if our kids, our teens, and on down may be dismissed for their classes at this point, thank you, young people, for being in church. We do appreciate that. Roberta, it is good to see you today. Thank you for coming all the way up here. We we prepared this weather just for you. Yes, yes, we like Illinois cold, don't we? No, 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 not so much. But we'll take what we get. It's going to be in the 50s here this week, so it's, it's going to change. By faith, this week, we're going to get the awning put back up. Uh, we will um, get the blankets off the concrete. And, uh, but we still won't be able to use the new concrete next Sunday. So we got one more Sunday to go where we're just going to park over on the east side. But then uh, after that, uh, we will be able to use it. Uh, we won't be able to put any lines on it until sometime in the spring. So you're going to have to just do your best, right? Just going to have to do your best. So we'll still plan to come in the same way and sort of try to park the same way we've been parking but uh, anyway, it'll be a little different. But I think we'll figure it out. That concrete is beautiful. Thank you to everybody that's uh, contributed to, to make that possible. And uh, we are now collecting money for phase two. I hate to say it, but putting in phase one was really hard on the old asphalt just east of that concrete. It, it took a lot of use and abuse. We really need to replace that. It's a $62,000 project. But the good news is we've already got about 20000 seeded into that. And so uh, we're just looking to raise about another 42. So if you want to help us out with a, a year-end gift, uh, that would be great. We wouldn't do this till the spring. So uh, thank you for considering that. Any gift of any size would be appreciated. All right, well, I want to take you back to two weeks ago. Matthew, what happened two weeks ago? You got baptized. Amen. Nancy was right there with you. So we had a great time with our water baptism service two weeks ago. And I'm sure you all remember the message that I preached was talking about change. Everybody gets excited about change. <laughs> well, maybe not. But the change I was talking about two weeks ago was the God kind of change. How when you come to Jesus, there are changes in heaven, remember that, that make changes on earth. When we understand and see what God has done, when we ask Jesus to come into our heart, he forgives us all of our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He writes his name in the book. He makes us join heirs with Jesus. We are now his beloved sons and daughters with whom he is well pleased. We get credited with the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I mean, we are something in heaven when we come to Jesus. Isn't that true? Now, we, we could get a little happy this morning. Happiness is good. This is Thanksgiving, right? But sometimes it doesn't always translate to earth. In heaven, it's a, it's a settled deal. Your name's in the book of life, and angels rejoice, and they throw a party and all of that. But on earth, sometimes we kind of struggle. But the reality is, is that we've got to let what happens in heaven get into us here on earth. 
and remember who we are, right? Who we are in Christ. And that's huge. Our identity. How do you see yourself? Oh, I'm just a sinner trying to make heaven. Come on, brother, that's not in the book, right? You are God's beloved son or daughter. You are more than a conqueror. Nothing can separate you from his love. Do I need to go on? Right? I mean, all these great and precious promises. We've got the Holy Spirit, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, does what? Lives in us. I mean, it is something. When there's a change in heaven when you come to Christ, there's a change on earth. So I want to flesh that out just a little bit here today. Because, you know, let, let's ask, does becoming a Christian change the way you live? It should. I think I heard that out there. <laughs> we all know people, though, probably for whom it hasn't changed very much. So we kind of scratch our head, don't we? Or we honestly can take a look at ourselves. It's like, I know I gave my life to Jesus but I'm still wrestling with this or that, or my life isn't quite what I thought it would be uh, when I came to Christ. So <clears throat> I know when I came to Jesus, there were a lot of changes uh, that took place on earth. You know, I was a sailor, so I had a sailor's vocabulary, which is usually limited, and, uh, and, and that got changed, and and some relationships got changed and started going to church and started reading the Bible. There were, there were changes that took place when I recommitted my life to Christ. And uh, those are all good and, and well, and those are things that should change, or we should be working on changing those things. But the change I want to talk about today is, is, is kind of like on a tectonic plate level, okay? You know what a tectonic plate is? It's, it's the plates that rest under the continents that cause earthquakes. You know, there's these big plates that all the land mass sits on, and these tectonic plates are kind of like floating on lava. And I know this is sounding bizarre, even as I'm saying this. Um, but still, there's these plates that move, and sometimes these plates collide, and what happens? There's an earthquake, right? It's, it's a deep, deep shifting. And that is exactly what happens when a person really comes to Christ, really digs in to start following him, becomes a disciple of the word of God. And that, that's important, right? You can become a Christian, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and just stay right there on kind of a, a superficial level. Or you can dig in, really follow Jesus, learn the word of God, and there's a shifting that goes on in your worldview, how you look at life. The things that move you, there's, there's, there's a difference there. And, you know, Jesus was, was really honest about this uh, and how there's going to be some changes, about how our priorities are going to change. Our definition of success begins to change. How many of you believe that? That when you become a Christian and really follow Jesus, success changes. It, it really does. Success moves. And so it's... It's such a deep thing when we come to Christ. It makes us different. Following Jesus makes us different. You know, we, we know 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But that's a bigger statement, I think, than what we realize. There's a new way of thinking, a new way of looking at life. And uh, Jesus was very upfront when he talked to his followers about this. You know, in, uh, in Luke's gospel, chapter 6, and, uh, and verse 20, we'll start out there. But let me just give you the context of this. Because uh, earlier in verse 6, Jesus went up on a mountainside to pray. And, and he spent the whole night up there praying. And he came down and then he appointed his apostles the people that were going to be his closest disciples. And so this is a really a, like a watershed moment. This is almost like a commissioning. It's like, okay, I select you, Peter. I select you, John. I select you, James. You guys are going to be apostles. And then he sits down all of his disciples. 
and he talks to them about what that's going to mean for their lives. So verse 20, Matthew or Luke chapter 6. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. Now, I don't always pause right now to pray, but I feel like we need to just take a moment to let this sink in. This is, this, there's some substance here, real substance. The Bible's always got substance, but I think there's something we just need to hear today. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. God, your word is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God, I just pray that you would uh, open our eyes to what you are saying as you commissioned your apostles and as I believe you commission us as your followers present day. God, may we get it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of the message is Now and Then. How many of you believe that what you do now affects what, affects what happens then? Right? You know, if you decide that, you know, tomorrow you're not going to go to work, so what you do in the now is going to affect, then you may not have a job, right? If, if you uh, mess with somebody today, they may not be your friend then, right? So the now and the then is such a real thing. We, we get that. But there's a bigger now and then, and that is about how we live as followers of Jesus now versus the then of eternity and what happens then. And a lot of times we get really caught up on what's happening in the now and kind of lose sight of the then, we, we want all the kingdom promises and all the blessings, but we want it when? Now. now. We want it now. But the reality is that sometimes you've got to take some hits and pay some prices now so that you can receive the reward of then. Right? Now I say, well, Pastor, I was coming here for a happy Thanksgiving message, and <laughs> We'll, we'll cover happy Thanksgiving message probably next Sunday. But uh, this, is, this is, again, it's talking about change. It's talking about the people that Jesus wants us to become. There is a cost to following Jesus in the now. But it pays great rewards in the then. And so um, this morning, I just want us to see uh, the cost of being a follower of Jesus it's going to make this life harder in some ways now. But there is a reward for those who have been faithful in the now. And I want to just give you three, uh, three things that uh, it's going to cost you in the now. But it will pay you well in the then. Okay, so here's the first one. Jesus is talking about the material cost, number one. You know, in good Jesus style, Jesus was a great communicator. Still is a great communicator. Somebody say amen. Jesus still talks to us, right? My sheep, Jesus said, hear my voice. But Jesus starts this out. He's got his all disciples lined up. They're all on the front row. And he's like, okay, boys, here's, here's the way this is going to go down. Okay, are you, are you ready to be an apostle? This is the, what it's going to look like. Blessed are the poor. John, John, did he say anything about poverty? (laughs) 
I don't, I don't think I got that email. I mean, it was like, wait, wait a minute. Jesus is like, okay, so you're with me now, boys, and this is the way it's going to be. You're going to be blessed because you're going to experience poverty. In fact, you're, you're going to be blessed because there's going to be some hunger involved in your life. But if you will stay faithful now and pay the price of some material cost, really in cost of things that don't really matter in the end anyway. If you'll be faithful then, faithful now, you'll receive the reward then. And so it's like, you know, Jesus is great to get their attention. And uh, let's, let's take a look at a verse that I think explains this a little better. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20 and 21. I'm going to let Liz put it up here for me. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven... Where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. All right. When Jesus has our hearts, our treasure follows. Do you believe that? When Jesus has our hearts, treasure follows. And so he's, he's letting them know that... Uh, this is, this is the way it's going to be if you're going to really follow me. You know, there's a simple passion, I think, when we love Jesus with all of our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our strength. We want to invest in what's important to Jesus. We want to invest in that. We believe in that. We believe in the cause. It's, we believe in the calling. We believe in the mission and the purpose and so when we, when we follow Jesus with all of our hearts, we want to sow into that work. And I think that this is such a, a good reminder right here in this season of our mission's emphasis. Let's be honest. That money number that you put on that little card that you said you would give every month, just be it honest, you probably could have used that money at home for something else. Now, if you're saying, no, Pastor, I, I really couldn't, well, then let's talk after service. I've got some more ideas for you to help you out. But I'm going to guess that there are places in your family budget, you say, well, you know, I could have put that in my retirement fund. I could have I bought meat. That was supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> but it's not funny. It's like it's painful going to the meat section. So many times I've walked by and shook my head and say, uh-uh, and have gone on. Go to cereal. Cereal's a great substitute. <laughs> Cocoa Krispies are great comfort food. Just putting that out there. But, but the, the point of this is that, you know, you, you don't have to, to give that money to missions. You could have used that for something else, but you decided in your hearts that, you know what, it is important to me to invest in kingdom work of reaching people for Jesus. And so I am going to put a number on that card. I am going to fill it in, and I'm going to give every month, not because I've just got surplus money running out of my ears, but because I believe in it, right? I mean, we believe in missions. We believe that that's important. We're so gr glad that somebody cared enough to tell us about Jesus, that we pay it forward so that other people can also come to know him. You know, you would probably be astounded if you could calculate up, some of you have been following Jesus for a long time, how many tens of thousands of dollars that you have sown into the kingdom of God. Whether your tithes, offerings, missions offering, things you've given to people because you felt like Jesus was prompting you to do that. We, if we could calculate it all up, we have given, if you're, a, if you're a, a, a faithful giver, you've literally given thousands and thousands of dollars away over the course of your life that you could have kept to make your life a little better. But, this is not an anti-tithing message, okay? This is, this is an importance of, of sowing. It's that, you know, I believe that the kingdom of God is greater than all the kingdoms of the earth. 
And I'm going to give faithfully that the kingdom message can be proclaimed in my town and around the world. I'm going to support my church. I'm going to support other ministries. I'm going to help people when they're down. And I'm going to give to missions. I'm going to do this because I believe in it. And so it's cost you something, hasn't it? It's, every time you write your tithe check, every time you write that missions check or put that cash in the offering, it costs you something. But I want to tell you today that because it costs you something now that Jesus says you are going to inherit a kingdom that is far greater than anything any of us can imagine. Now, we don't inherit that because we give, right? But when we give, we, we give in the now knowing what's coming in the then, that there's going to be a reward. I mean... I can't quite imagine this, but the Bible says that we are joint heirs with Christ. I mean, everything that Jesus gets, we get to share in it. We just lost our wreath back there. It just, it was more than it could take. It gave up in the now. There's a lesson there. It gave up in the now. Not good. But you think about this. What we do in the now matters in the then. I, I am fully convinced that we will never regret anything that, that materially we have sacrificed. Can, can I just add this in here that this is not just like money? How many of you know that many times time is more valuable than your money? You have volunteered thousands of hours over the course of your Christian life. Hours you could have used to make more money, to make your life more comfortable. But no, you said, you know what, it's important for me to be on the worship team. It's important for me to teach a Sunday school class. It's important for me to work in a, an outreach organization. It's important for me to come to Tuesday morning prayer. It's important to me to do these things. And so you've, you've taken a hit in the now. But the then is when it pays off. You will be thankful for the hours that you invested in kingdom work. There's a material cost, yes, to following Jesus, but there is an incredible payoff then. And I hope that as you follow Jesus, that, that you live with the then in mind and keep that in focus. Okay, that's, that's one cost. There's a material cost, money and time. If we're going to follow Jesus, those are both going to be things that we lay down for his kingdom and glory. But secondly, there's an emotional cost. Verse 21, the last part of it. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Now, what in the world does that mean? You know, following Jesus changes the way we see life. You know, in the early part of Jesus' ministry, Jesus was really, really popular. Even the sinners wanted Jesus to come to their parties. Jesus was like, yeah, he was wanted everywhere. In fact, his critics came against him for hanging out with sinners. But sinners wanted Jesus around. I think Jesus had a great sense of humor. I think Jesus had a great laugh. I'm looking forward to hearing Jesus laugh in heaven. Um, I know that's, that's funny. I, I can recognize Mary Ann's laugh anywhere. She's got a great laugh. One of these days, I'm going to get to hear Jesus laugh. And I think it's going to run all through my heart. There was a time when Jesus had a, more of a popularity, but the more Jesus preached, his popularity declined and his enemies increased. And I think that we see in this, this passage here in, uh, let's see, where is it? In Matthew 23, 37, I think Liz has got that one for us. This we talk about the emotional cost of following Jesus. This is Jesus, Matthew 23. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. 
I believe the tears were running down Jesus' face when he stood there and looked across the city of Jerusalem. He knew what was coming. He knew the then for them because in the now they had rejected him. It broke Jesus' heart. I think Jesus carried a lot of heaviness in his heart. Yes, he knew the then, but in the now, Jesus wept. I mean, you know, you think, well, why would he weep at the tomb of Lazarus? Because in the now, even though you know the then, even though he knew what he was going to do, he wept in the now. I believe for, for all of the Lazarus who would one day die and the many that would die without a knowledge of God. And there was a heaviness in Jesus' heart. You know, I can't say I'm anywhere near Jesus on this, so please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But as I live in this world, my heart gets heavier and heavier. I may not be the outwardly weepy kind of guy, but in my heart, when I see the changes going on in our nation, when I work with people that are going through brokenness that, that they wouldn't have to go through if they would just do what Jesus says. There is a, there's a heaviness, uh, the, a soberness, I guess, about life. I really feel this keenly that in the now, there, is, there are so many things that uh, just really, really touch me. And uh, when I think about Matthew 7, Verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. You know what? That, that is troublesome. Because I think there's a lot of us who kind of feel like, you know, yeah, most people are good people and when they die they're going to go to heaven because God is good and merciful. I don't believe that. I believe that. That there's a broad road that leads to destruction and many are going to go down that road and there is a narrow road that leads to life and few there are that find that. And you know, I see so much in, in our world uh, and not, I don't want to pick on younger people because it's older people too, but especially I see it in younger generations coming up. They've not been raised in church. Nobody took them to Sunday school. They are, they are looking for some reason to go on living, and, and it breaks my heart to see uh, so many on this broad path that leads to destruction, and especially so many of them who, who did have the privilege of being raised in church and having godly parents or at least godly grandparents that loved them and prayed for them and to see them today on a road that leads to death, that should break our hearts. You know, I wish it could just be all fun and games in this life. I love to have a good time, but it seems like the older I get, the more I struggle with that because I see the brokenness of our world, and I know what's going to happen in the then. Oh, there's a lot of laughter and partying up and all of that going on, but Jesus says, you know, woe to you who laugh now because then you're going to mourn and, and weep. Man, I almost feel like I'm a Debbie Downer here, but I don't want to be that. Uh, I, but I, I just think that sometimes we need to stop and think that heaviness that you feel, that trouble that you feel in your spirit when you go to family gatherings and you hear their conversations and you know they don't have a lick of care for Jesus and you, and you leave there and you just feel that. That's, that's the weeping now. As we pray for those people, as we pray for our community, as we pray for our land, as we pray for our leaders, I weep over the quality of people we are electing to the highest offices in our nation. It grieves me because they are not going to lead us into godly paths. And it breaks my heart and I weep over my, my country. But, you know, I'm encouraged when that Jesus says, you know what, it's okay. It's okay 
to have a sober heart and a weeping heart now. But then we're going to enjoy laughter like we've never known. But yeah, there's an emotional cost to following Jesus. And, and so it is, it is a big deal. Okay, one more cost. The relational cost. This is another attention getter. Verse 22, Jesus says, blessed are you when men hate you. Oh boy, I can see Peter, James, and John now sitting there saying, did you sign up for this? He didn't tell us this before he appointed us. Hey, Jesus said, this is the way it's going to go down. There's going to be people that, that hate you. They're going to reject you. They're going to resist you, and life is going to be hard for you. But you can't focus on that. You've got to focus on the then. And not only should they just kind of try to deal with it, but he, he says, verse 23, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. They hate me. They hate me. I mean, wow. I mean, that's a really big then you're focusing on, right? That's a really big then because it sure doesn't make sense now. But Jesus says, if you follow Jesus, you're going to tick people off. Now, how many of you have been there, done that? People don't always want to hear what we have to say. Jesus said, you know what? There's going to come a time when people are going to hate you. They're going to reject you. They're going to ridicule you. But you just keep your eyes on the then. You just remember which life you're living for. And you stand strong. And you keep living the truth. And you hold fast to me. And you hold fast to the word of God. And you are going to make it. You know, there's a contrast in verse 26. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that's how their fathers treated the false prophets. You know what? When everybody likes you, you're probably telling people only what they want to hear. That's what a false prophet does, right? Let's see, I'm gonna, let's see you're going to pay me the most money. I'm going to tell you what you want to hear. That's a false prophet. If you just want everybody to be happy, then you're just going to tell them what they want to hear. But if you want to make an eternal difference and get more people off the broad path and onto the narrow path, you're going to stand up for something, and there's going to be some people that are going to push back and say, no. I think that happened to Jesus. Don't you? All men did not speak well of Jesus. And Jesus paid the ultimate price. Now, let me just clarify something here. That, that verse, end of verse 22, they reject your name as evil. Why? Because of the Son of Man. Not because you were legalistic and hateful. Okay? Not because you were hypocritical. Okay? I mean, if you want to pick up rejection, there's a lot of easy ways to do it. And it's not, it's not a God thing. But if, if you're rejected because of the Son of Man, it's because of the truth you stand for. And I think sometimes we, we kind of push off the rejection in life we experience. That, well, it's because I'm a Christian. No, it's because you're a lazy worker. Okay? It's because you're always critical. It's because you don't live what you tell other people. Come on now, I'm just, I'm just being honest. There's a lot of reasons that people might reject us or marginalize us. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. Don't be rejected because you don't have good hygiene. Don't be rejected because you are so critical of everybody around you. If you're going to be rejected legitimately, let it be because you have a bright light for Jesus and people don't like it. Amen? I mean, that's, that's the thing of it. We, we should be letting our light shine before men that they might see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven, but some people won't like it. And you know what I say to you? Congratulations. That's why I believe we can rejoice when people speak ill of us. It's like, they see some Jesus in me. They see something worth resisting. They see in me a light that they reject just like they rejected Jesus. And I'm not going into this intentionally trying to tick people off. But if what I stand for ticks people off, you know what? I am okay having people mad at me if I'm doing it to bring glory to Jesus. Right. 
we're living in a crazy time when people that should be on our team are rejecting us and hating us because of truth that we stand for. And you know what? I will not back down from the truth of God's word. It doesn't matter how much it's rejected, no matter how much it might be opposed, publicly humiliated, it doesn't matter. If we live our lives for Jesus and let our light shine, I expect people to not like me. Okay? They say, oh, pastor, that that sounds scary. No, that sounds biblical. To us who stand firm and follow Jesus, we're going to pick up some heat. Expect it. And expect it as America gets darker. But I I beseech thee, brethren and sistern, if there is such a word, (laughs) I beseech thee, stay faithful in the now. Stay faithful in the now. There was, you know, there were seven churches in the book of Revelation. And most all of them took a little heat from Jesus. Had to give them a little tune-up. You ever been tuned up by Jesus before? Yeah. But there's a church in Smyrna that, that didn't get a tune-up. Let's read this in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, Those, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Be thou faithful unto death. And Jesus says, I will give you the crown of life. Can I just encourage you today as I wind this down? Be faithful to make a material investment of your time and treasure in the kingdom of God. Don't let the recession word, don't let the prices of meat, don't let anything deter you from doing what Jesus says, investing your hours, investing your treasure. Be faithful unto death in the now, because in the then, great is your reward. Be faithful to to let your heart be engaged in your faith. Be faithful to to be a broken person over the sins of this world. You know, it's easier to just be happy, 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 but that's not what Jesus called us to. He called us to weep, to pray, to, to care, to invest our hearts. Be faithful to let your heart experience the things that God's heart experiences. And if it leads you to weep, so be it. But stay faithful to that and be emotionally invested. And then lastly, again, being relational. You know, there's going to be people who don't like what we have to say. There's going to be people who will marginalize you. Maybe people that should be the closest people to you. But they don't get you. They don't understand you. Don't change to fit in with them. Stay true to Jesus. Be faithful to what you believe. Hold on to your convictions. Don't bow. Don't give in. Be faithful unto death. And let every relationship that you have be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, as we do that, then we have great reward. The take home on this is that in the now, let us choose to live for the then. We're all going to be with unique people probably in the coming week. We have an opportunity to just really follow Jesus. 
to be true to who we are, to not laugh at their stuff if we don't think it's funny, to not chime in, to not compromise and tell a little story. We have an opportunity to be bold, to be anointed, to live in the now as Jesus would have us to, so that in the then we receive great reward. I'm going to ask all of you to stand with me. I know we're ending a little early, so Tara's not up here. She's still teaching her class, but that's all right. How many of you are going to be with people here in the coming week that you know don't know Jesus and you would like to have an impact? Just, I just see your hand. All right. I want to pray for you. Father God, I thank you today. I thank you, God, that we can have heaven's perspective on life. God, I know there's, in this, this next month and a half, as we even enter into Christmas time, there's, there, there's a, a levity in our culture during this time. And God, we're, we're grateful for the true meanings that underpin these things. But God, we, we go forward into these coming weeks with the mindset, God, that, that we are here to be agents of change, to help people understand that the now matters for the then. God, help us to live true to who we are, to stand strong in your word, to not back down at those political conversations, those cultural conversations, that God, that we would be true to what we believe. God, that we would be faithful to your word. God, that we would live as true followers of Jesus. God, it's sometimes a very difficult now. But God, we choose to live for the then. That day, God, when the kingdom of our heaven is ours. God, the day when we will laugh with a deep laughter like we have never known. Jesus, when we will receive all of the benefits of any persecution that we have ever had to endure in this life. God, when there is that well done, thou good and faithful servant. God, I thank you for this church family. God, I thank you that that I believe they are following after you, that Jesus, they understand what we're, we're talking about here today. And God, I, I believe they get this. And I just pray for strength for them. I pray, God, that every sacrifice they make, every cost they have to pay, that God, that it would be multiplied a hundredfold in heaven. God, you've promised us that in your word, that there's nothing that we lose in this life, that you don't give it back to us to the fullest in the life that's to come. God, we thank you that, uh, that Christianity is for this life, but it really gets good in the next. God, thank you for that blessed hope that's in our heart. Father God, I pray for us to keep that eternal perspective, to live right in the now so that we can receive the reward in the then. And God, as we go to these family gatherings this week, I pray, Jesus, that you would open doors and opportunities for us just to let our light shine in unique ways. God, give us the, the stories, the insights, the open doors, the opportunities, God, to, to just speak forth truth. Give us boldness, Father God, we pray. And Jesus, I just pray now, is, is there anybody in the house that you're not a follower of Jesus? You're not a Christian or you need to recommit your life to Christ? Anybody out there in Facebook land where you need to give your life to Jesus? This would be a great Sunday to do it. The Sunday before Thanksgiving, you would truly understand what thankful is. Is there anybody out there in Facebook land, anybody in the house, that you need to recommit your life to Christ? Since I can't see past that camera, I'm just going to pray a model prayer prayer that you at home can pray if you want to give your life to Christ or recommit your life to Christ. And the prayer goes something like this. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I ask Jesus that you would forgive me of my sins. I ask Jesus that you would come into my heart, that you would forgive me and, and wipe away all of my disobedience. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. Jesus, I embrace you now as my personal Lord and Savior, and I will live for you. Amen. That simple prayer starts the greatest change you will ever experience. Uh,
Hallelujah. We're going to make it, aren't we, church? Hallelujah. By the grace of God, no matter what comes, we're going to make it. We're going to hold fast to Jesus, no matter the cost. Team, lead us in a closing song.
that you have done, all that you are doing today, the things you're going to do in tonight's community service, Lord, I pray that you will be high and lifted up, that our eyes will be focused on you, and that nothing will interfere with us being able to come together as a community to worship you. give you thanks and we give you praise for all these things. Be with each and every one as they may be traveling this week.